you stood up, you focused, you're here. So let's talk about influencers. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and uh, thinking about growing up, uh, there were a lot less choices in the jobs that I thought about. Now that we're like 20 years into the YouTube generation, and yes, we are almost 20 years, I see an entire generation of kids who just grow up and say, I want to be a YouTube influencer. I want to be an evangelist. I mean, jobs that I would have never thought of. So just to give you an idea, there are 50 million self-declared creators in this economy, and it is growing fast. The market size has grown to 104 billion, and it's growing fast also. Uh, investors, 1.3 billion into the space. So how can retailers hop on the speeding train or, um, and, and yeah, and hope it's a speeding train, you know, that's not gonna get them? Hang on, because you are about to find out. Sharon Weissman, our moderator today, is the CEO of Power Station, and she will be your moderator as we explore the secret so so sauce, my New York is showing, the secret sauce for combining the magic of creators and influencers with the magic of retail. So hang on for the ride. <laughs> Thanks, Robin, you're the best. Um, I'm Sharon Weissman, I have to share something with you. I get on stage quite a bit, and it's always the morning of that I ask myself, did I do this? I get so nervous. Couldn't I just be like a normal person walking around the show floor looking for free candy? Um, but here I am, and the minute I get on stage, these marvelous Miss Maisel vibes come upon me, and it all works out great. And I have this amazing panel, so let's have fun. But before we really dive into things, I wanted to ask you guys a few questions just to make sure we customize the conversation, because uh, we value your time. Does everyone know the difference between a creator and an influencer? Rise your hand if you know the difference. Okay, good to know. Have any of you activated an influencer or a creator in the past? Perfect, that coincides with the 93% of marketers who activated influencers in the last year. So the main difference between a creator and an influencer is that an influencer influences. You utilize them for exposure and for reach, while a content creator creates superior content. You use them to get your brands farther via skill. Is every influencer a creator? Yeah. Is every creator an influencer? Hell no. But as the end consumer, sometimes it's interchangeable, right? We actually don't know the difference. All we want is someone to strike the chord of authenticity and give us something that we should want to buy and give us an experience. So today I had to wear something that social media made me buy. Um, an awesome creator um, spoke about this and I didn't care that it was oversized or not my color. It made me laugh. It corresponded with my values and here I am. So, Let's get to know the panel better. Robin told you, I work for Power Station Studios. We are, no doubt, um, the best creative collective on the planet. Uh, it is undisputed. We meet our clients where creativity and commerce come together, and we bridge them while having fun. Uh, so if it's licensing or digital or branding, um, we're here to discover trends mile to wild. And here to my left is Gavin Gallis, who will tell us a bit about himself. Hi, everyone. Glad you all made it out. It's the big hike out here to the Venetian. Um, really excited to be here. I run Project Bankman. It's named after Bill Murray's character in Ghostbusters. Uh, we built the Bill Murray NFT collection this year and sold out our membership. And we have our first member event at the end of this month in California, where folks who own our NFTs get to go meet Bill Murray and yeah, swap stories. Congrats. Um, so we, we work with uh, celebrities, we work with creative communities, and we work with brands to design what we feel like are memberships and loyalty programs, um, helping tell stories, helping draw communities closer together, and working in this new technology of Web3. Perfect. Um, and next in line, we have Dylan Yui. He is the holy grail. He's a creator, he's an influencer, he's a podcaster. He's, what, what are you not? <laughs> I do a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm a content creator. I also go to University of Southern California. Um, 
manage a ton of creators. So I have a million followers myself, manage creators with over 100 million followers plus. At USC, I run the first and only student organization that's focused on content creators, influencers, and social media called USC Reach. We have over 80 members with 10,000 followers on the micro side, all the way up to 10 million followers plus individually. We just expanded that club, that student organization, to a national level. So we're now in UCLA, LMU, Chapman, and Duke. We're expanding to the Midwest this upcoming semester. So I'm the resident content creator in this panel, Gen Z, um, yeah. <laughs> And what Gavin didn't tell you is it's his 24th birthday. Um, Vegas is definitely the place to celebrate your 21st uh, birthday. And if you guys stick to the end, uh, we might do a TikTok Maybe together. Yes. We'll have Maybe. Fun. <laughs> and you'll be famous. Um, Lauren Godset. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lauren Goodset, and I am coming from Mintel, which if you aren't familiar, we are a global market research firm. We focus on consumer data as well as product data. So I focus in the beauty sector, um, but today I am obviously here to talk about influencers and really look from a consumer standpoint of what do they understand and really what are they looking for when it comes to those influencers so that brands can really pick the right one to partner with. Max. My name is Max Benader. <laughs> I'm the co-founder and CEO of Orca. We are a live and social commerce solution. So we handle everything from finding the host talent, the influencers and creators, producing short form videos. We have studios in Los Angeles where we do shoppable live streams. We handle all commerce management. So we make sure that customers are, we're responding to customers' comments, whether it's on TikTok or YouTube or, or elsewhere, uh, make sure the product arrives on time. And we believe that all of e-commerce over the next few years is going to become interactive, social, live in some fashion. And so we're, we're excited to be doing what we're doing. So now you know why everyone is here together. We could find those sweet spots of how we move more product in a more efficient and fun way, how we create experiences for our audiences or and build communities. So the pandemic shifted us all indoors, right? We didn't go out, we didn't experience, we weren't hanging out in the malls, we weren't taking our kids to gaming stores and having a blast. And that social component of actual shopping as a personal experience went away. It became very transactional. So we all went to social where we could maybe shop with someone like an influencer or a creator, where we could correspond with brands, where we get recommendations um, and suggestions. And there's no doubt that social shopping and commerce is actually growing three times as fast as any other commerce, and it's going to hit a trillion dollars by 2025, which is 20% of all e-commerce. Right now, websites, as this panel can tell you, are very transactional. You go to a product page, you kind of know what you're buying, um, you go through the transaction, you didn't really share it, it was very personable and unshareable, but what these guys are doing is so different, it creates a whole new social element uh, for the shopping experience. Lauren, what are the trends Mintel is highlighting right now for your clients when it comes to social shopping and influencers? Yeah, so we have, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, consumer data. We also do a lot of forecasting and trend work, but I am gonna show you just a couple of slides of data. I think the data points are always the most powerful, so if we could click to the next slide. Sure. I got the power. <laughs> Thank you. Boom. So here we're just going to start off. This is data looking at influencers kind of holistically, not specific to beauty. Our next slide will be more specific to beauty. So at Mintel, we have reports globally. So here, uh, oh. oh, sorry, you want that one? <laughs> yeah, stay here. Yep. Um, so here, we'll just look at these really quick. So we, what we do for our reports, just to give you a kind of a little bit of a background, we panel about 1,000 consumers in each of these countries. So you'll see the first stat that we have here on the screen is, is this the first one, Sharon? Um, 
Okay, all right, let's stay here for a minute. So these, these are the general stats. So in the US, we have about 70% of consumers saying that they follow specific influencers because they wanna learn from them. And I think this panel will talk a lot about education and really the pairing of education and influencers together and how that's more meaningful for the consumer. Then the center stat we see here is coming from some of our China data. This is talking about virtual influencers and the benefits that consumers find that they can utilize when they are using, when brands are using a virtual influencer. And then the last stat here is coming from the UK, about 40% of consumers, when they think about what's most annoying when they're looking at influencer content, it's when that, con that sponsored content is not believable. So all of these points will connect throughout our discussion. We just kind of wanted to verse you in some data. So these are the general, and then if we go to the next slide, these are just beauty specific. Beauty is you know, my favorite category. Mintel covers a plethora of other categories. But here, just looking kind of more at the beauty realm, we see that in China, consumers are saying that they, they, it increases the favorability of an influencer if the influencer is using different formats. In the US, when we think about kind of the face of the influencer, they're not looking for those models, perfect pictures anymore. It's really looking at a reflection of themselves within the influencer community. And then in the UK, just really here to reinforce that influencers are impacting the buying process, especially for that younger generation, that they are making those decision, purchase decisions based on what they're seeing the influencers put out on those social networks. So again, just kind of ground us in some data, and now we can talk about more interesting yeah. aspects. I think Mitchell's data really shows us that it's not one size fits all, right? What is social shop shopping? In, in every territory, it means something else, and the consumer behavior really dictates how they want to shop and who they want to shop from. Dylan, since you're on the field, yes. do these coincide with what you're seeing? Are you riding these trends? Yeah, you know, I started social media in 2016, and back in 2016, it was a lot of me outreaching to brands and showing them why I was of value for them to get involved with me and proving that I had the KPIs and the numbers to work with them. I think now we're seeing more and more brands and every single brand working with influencers. I think there's a fine line where it's like, in the last few years, a lot of brands have didn't really know how to work with influencers, so brands would give us their, their creative briefs, their captions that they want, their specific pictures. So it was literally every single thing that you had to do was copy and paste what they their creative team came up with or their marketing team. I'm seeing a lot more brands put ownership into the creator and giving the creators freedom to take their product, take their consumer good, and run with it based off of what me as a creator, any of the creators who, I've met. Who knows the audience better than you, right? Creators do, 100%, and more and more brands are doing that nowadays. I think from a brand perspective, that makes sense. Uh, from the social networks perspective, they're not as excited that influencers and creators are actually bypassing their paid ads algorithms, and those are changing all the time, right? Um, so speaking a bit about social networks, are social networks uh, losing their luster? Uh, Facebook isn't as popular anymore. Uh, Gen Z is saying cool is dead. If cool is dead, is social media dead? I mean, we did shit on their planet, and now they're all very upset, and they think nothing matters. And if nothing matters, does social media matter? Does it matter what I wear? Or who? We're all too old for peer pressure, right? So speaking about how do we not depend as much on social media networks, Gavin, maybe we could talk a bit about the what we call the dark social, um, you know, Telegram, Discord, where creators have a direct line to the communities that they're building and then eventually selling to. Absolutely, yeah, any new technology has its good and its bad. The, there's been a lot of headlines in the crypto space around you know, these things called rug pulls where people create fake identities, they build a community, and then they don't deliver on, on what they promise. Um, but I think if we, if we step back and we look at the big picture in terms of Web3, and Web3 means kind of this next evolution of the internet encompasses crypto and NFTs and metaverse and a lot of uh, bucket buzzwords. Um, but th th these are direct channels. So with Telegram, I can build an audience overnight. And yes, some of those are bots. Some of those are folks that are you know scammers. There's a lot of moderation that needs to happen. Same with Discord. We, we built a community. We have about 10,000 folks. 
in a in a Discord just talking about Bill Murray and and you know the the content around him and his life and this membership and the I'm I'm not an anonymous there I'm I'm there as Gavin so I I'm on the hook and a lot of the better communities are focusing on that the authenticity having leadership that's doxed meaning they're they're documented they're real um, and and being able to to stand behind their product so if I don't deliver to my community you know if Bill Murray doesn't show up at the party I'm on the line. Um, so that's really the, the future, and brands will look at this as well, is you, know, you can reach these communities quickly, you can get out in front of it, um, you can interact in real time. It's so awesome to have you know, live interactions with, with true fans, true owners, true members. Um, but with that comes more accountability, more responsibility, um, and it's even faster paced than something like Twitter. And how do you know who you're selling to? I mean, at the end of the day, of, in Discord, everyone has their profile pick as something that you know, is a, is a bit elusive. They, they love being semi-incognito and not giving up information. How do you really gauge performance? How do creators really reach out? Is there a good kind of mix of realities there? I think there's a lot of different, different answers there. The, um, you know, I think most of us would love more privacy. I think there's certain parts of our life in terms of our, our shopping habits and things like that where we wish we gave out less data. Um, so the idea, you know, in the future is can we really be the identity we want to be and put the data out that we do want to share? So, you know, if, if Nike is launching this new NFT project, you know, and I get to get early access, I'm okay disclosing my name to them because I trust the brand, and they're going to send me a pair of sneakers in exchange for that address that I'm, I'm sending it to. So, yes, there is a trade of data, um, but it's because I'm opting in instead of, like, I'm being forced to join this platform because all my friends are there. And, and my, my data is, is taken by default. So I think the future is really this opt-in system where there is a good trade between how much privacy we give up, how much data we share, and the benefits we actually get for it. And we, the more we feel loyal to brands and the more the brands are loyal back to us, I think that's where we get this good uh, interaction and, and better lifetime value. I agree. Let's talk a bit about uh, talent matchmaking. How do you find the right influencer or creator for your brand, right? It goes both sides. I'm scared, I'm handing my IP into Dylan's hand or another creator, and from his standpoint, he also, to Gavin's um, uh, point, has credibility in front of his community to do right by them. So how do you actually find the right entity how do you get them excited about a project, uh, about a product, and actually be able to sell it? Um, Max, how do you do it? How do you brief? Yeah, well, we're we're looking for something specific because live stream shoppable content and short shoppable videos are not quite at scale in the U.S. yet. In other parts of the world, it's a really it's a really big deal. Hundreds of billions of dollars in sales in APAC this year alone. And as the shopping tools become more available in the US, I believe we're gonna see that same growth trend here. And so if you're looking for a creator or an influencer purely to align your brand with them as an awareness effort, then I think you're looking for a match for your brand and and you might go through their, their socials and make sure they're a fit, and I, and I think that's a really great path to take. If you're focused on driving revenue or sales, you wanna find someone that's knowledgeable, passionate, and all of this, by the way, and I think we all agree, all of this relies on authenticity, right? So that's, I should say, that's at the, at the very beginning. You wanna make sure that there's an authentic voice behind the, the creator or influencer. Um, but when someone goes live and they're, they're selling and they're educating, it's gotta be somebody who has charisma and who is passionate about the product. And it might not matter that their entire social life doesn't revolve around that particular product. So there's direct selling and there's endorsement or awareness. And I think those are slightly different and it depends on your objective as a brand. And we're really hyper-focused on revenue generation and creating sales channels for our brand partners. So we, we look for sellers and hosts and creators and influencers that are capable of getting the brand message out in, and converting to purchase, frankly. Yeah, no, I totally get that. 
Lauren, what, what kind of data or insights are your clients looking for when they evaluate influencers? I mean, when it comes to beauty, there's so, you need legit experts mm -hmm. to come across as someone who I believe and I want to, you know, more than a pretty face, per se. Right. Yeah, I mean, we've had this conversation with our clients for years. You know, who should I pick? What type of person should I go after? And in 2018, we started saying you really need to look for experts in the field. It's more than just you have a social media presence or you have that reach. What is the expertise behind what you're telling these consumers? And so we've continued that trend, you know, into today. We have a trend coming from 2023 called Beauty RX. And this is about the medicalization of the beauty industry. But really it comes back to saying, look at doctors, dermatologists, estheticians, who has some piece of credibility that they can lend to really make that story that Max was just talking to you about. Because it isn't enough that you just like a certain product or you like a particular category or field. You need to really have some merit behind the words that you're actually saying. And when we look at our data, I think you saw that uh, data point that really spoke to education. They want someone who has a background to be able to uh, adequately uh, educate them and to give them that knowledge. That's really what they're looking for. Yeah, which makes them authentic. I think that's where it really lies. I won't lie, I don't care if someone is awkward AF, as long as I believe that he has the knowledge and the background and he's authentic and he's selling this product because he cares or uses it themselves and understands the overall benefit, um, that might just be enough for some brands. Um, let's dig deeper into live shopping because, hey, when it comes to the US, we know it works. We've seen QVC, we have historical references of people sitting, listening to content that is curated and then dialing to get it, right? Um, so Max, kind of back to you. Uh, how do you find that person that you spoke about before, that, that person with an X factor that is everything, both a expert and a salesperson and a marketer and has presence in front of a camera. That's yeah, really it, it takes a lot of work. I would say uh, less than 5% of the people that we meet will ultimately come and work with us because we are looking for something really special. We actually have a short reel. Are we able to play that? We Is that do. available? Do we'll this. see if it works. I'm, I'm excited to show this because we, we talk about live shopping, we mentioned QVC, but we're bringing, and I believe companies like ours, that's the, that's the slide about what we, is it, are we able to play that? I can do this. I know I can. <laughs> okay, it's all, it's all good if, uh, if we're not able to do it. But, you know, it's re this reel is really fun. And one of the things that I've realized is in the 20-ish years that we've had e-commerce, you don't really go shopping on the internet. You discover a product, you research a product, you purchase a product. But shopping is a social experience, as Sharon said early on, and live shopping allows you to have that experience like you're going to the mall uh, or shopping in real life. And so the, the reel that we had prepared showed a little bit of that, and you get a sense of the hosts that we, that we hire and um, you guys can go visit us at orcashop.co. There's some great material up there after the panel. We don't need to, I think they're working on it there. But it's, so it's totally okay. Maybe, so, maybe by the end of the panel. Uh, no, I, listen, I, I totally agree. Research shows that people spend more time in stores when it's done socially, right? When I'm hanging out with my friends, when I, I obviously can't dress myself. I need someone to go with me. I need recommendations. We need to make a whole day out of it. Um, so so if, if I'm actually engaged and I'm watching something that's entertaining and educating for me, that's trifecta, right? We, we, see, we, see, we see it every day. We see the sales, and it's really great to see Lauren's data because it aligns with what, um, with what we're seeing when we go live. And I shared something with you guys earlier in our, in our pre-meeting. Uh, I haven't built the slide yet, so bear with me on the numbers, but recently, we compared the sales in a, a one hour period from an, a standalone owned and operated website, the sales from a short form social video, and the sales in that same time period from a one hour live stream. It was $0 on the website, $50 on the video, $400 on the live stream. 
And when you watch the stream, you get it. Because somebody comes in to the live stream, wherever they happen to come from, what their favorite social platform, and they say, is this product waterproof? Or if it's Dylan or someone who they follow, do you like this? And when you respond yes, that gives them that push that they need to purchase. Yeah, validation. Uh, Dylan, what, what platforms work for you? I mean, we're seeing, you know, we, we had Amazon announce uh, Amazon Inspire, which will be a TikTok-like in-app opportunity. There'll be a, in the toolbar inside the Amazon app, you'll have a little light bulb and you could press it. And it's almost like the TikTok experience where you go through and yeah. you watch social shopping and with a click of a button, it's at your door. You know, it's interesting because I think creator partnerships and working with brands is a very two-way street for creators. Creators have to partner with the brands that they love as well as brands have to partner with the creators that are really outspoken and engaging with the brands that they utilize. I think where live shopping is headed towards and where a perfect place for live shopping falls down to is the live streaming and the platform that these creators have large audiences on. TikTok is working through that. Um, Snapchat's just implemented a live shopping experience and is working through that. I think one fine line is, as a creator, posting a product on your Instagram story is one thing, but I think pushing it a step forward and you know Max's data that he had in terms of me being an outspoken, passionate person about a product, my audience would 100% love me talking about the product that I love using more than just a random product I posted on my Instagram story because I was paid for. Right, I, that's totally understandable. And you know, Amazon just announced uh, the deal with Snapchat. They are starting with uh, eyewear to start off with and Web3 technologies are really going to start changing the way we influence, right? We can now try things on before we buy them. I have no doubt that my kids will come up to me one day and will say, you know, mom, how did you buy things in 2D? You went onto Amazon and you saw like a picture or something in 2D, you didn't even see the whole product and you clicked on it. And I'd be like, son, it's, you know, re returns were free. So I took a leap of faith and I bought something <laughs> and, 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 and I, you know, if I want, I returned it. But um, the returning structure and policies are changing as well. How is Web3 actually going to help creators with the right technology yeah, the, sell more products. Well, I think one on the on the there's the digital side which which you brought up and, and you do a lot of great work in. Um, so the idea of this digital twin, like there there's a digital representation of you, and if you go through the the halls here at the Venetian and, and the convention center, you'll see everything from medical devices, you know, human health to to really fun and engaging games, having this kind of digital and physical component. Um, some of the best brands are offering NFTs. It's really your purchase receipt, proof of ownership, and that anchor piece for your digital world to show that you own this exclusive one of one thing or this exclusive ticket. And then you, you, you get the physical product as well. When we launched the Bill Murray collection, we, we issued out um, rare um, solid metal coins engraved with each number from the collection as just one more touch point. And it's nice to have something physical, you know, to, to have you know, a purely digital membership. Um, so I, th I think that's one way it helps creators. The second is a direct audience relationship. The fact that you're in their digital wallet, you're on their phone, it's something that's lifetime and there's no intermediary there. It sits directly in your wallet, there's no big brand sitting between you and your customers. Um, that creates this membership that you can move to whatever platform you want, you can directly communicate. And so the opportunity for creators to not have to depend on YouTube, TikTok, Amazon, etc., to own their core audience, especially their, their core membership group, that's a really powerful thing and that's the promise of Web3. Whether that gets delivered for every creator and, and can be done at scale, that's really what we're gonna see over this next year. I, I agree. That will be really interesting to see these digital opportunities and Web3 applications kind of swoop in and, and help the way uh, we're influenced and what we buy. I also think it's really interesting that um, most of adults under the age of 35, not most, 30 to 40%, they fancy themselves creators themselves at this point. So. Do you guys think that eventually brands will enable with 
the Web3 platforms or even through live shopping um, for their fans and their followers to start co-creating, maybe even profiting from working with brands? I, I think there's a convergence of tool sets, right? Whether it's Web3 powered, where you can mint an NFT, or it's the ability to use an affiliate program and map in Snapchat a, a jacket you're wearing and, and make it available for purchase and earn a commission. I think that these tools are gonna come, become available really quickly. And so there's gonna be a lot of optionality and the brands that can identify the best talent partners, the best influencer, creator partners, are the ones that will succeed. And there, there, there is money to be made. There are sales to be had through this, whether it's a, a community-driven effort uh, or it's a, a large-scale campaign. Would you do it, Dylan? Would you co-create? Which brand would you want to co-create? <laughs> <laughs> Which brand? I mean, we're seeing Nike swoosh. We're Nike seeing collab. Wu. We're I, seeing I like Whole Nike. World and Niche. We're seeing all these platforms that are calling out. Yeah, would you have? Would would you do it? Co-create with a brand or with, a with brand. my fans? With a brand. A hundred percent. And I think we're seeing more and more creators become entrepreneurs and their own founders. The way I like to bubble creators are they're entrepreneurs. They run their own businesses, and under their own business, they have brands. Mr. Beast is killing it with. Feasibles, Mr. Beast Burger, David Dobrik just came out Dobrik's, and all these creators are putting ownership into themselves and expanding beyond social media, beyond the phone, beyond the laptop, and out to consumer goods and products. And I think we're going to see more and more partnerships, whether that's digital, because digital solves things and makes it so much easier to do, or in person. Um, you know, I, I'd love to do a partnership with like companies, like any company that I love personally. And I'll flip the script. Lauren, do you think that brands are willing to part, you know, to let go from their IP just a bit in order to get the community to have an open dialogue and, and influence the products that are selling? So I think, you know, from, from a beauty standpoint, from the big beauty brands, they look at the smaller, more indie-focused beauty brands and they say, how do they have this community? And that's really what the influencers have. It's the community. And so, yes, I definitely think that there is, there is a place where they would come to the influencers to tap into their community. I think they already are kind of doing that and from what we're seeing. I think from a... From a beauty standpoint, like Dylan said, we are seeing that the influ biggest influencers in this place, their next move is to become an entrepreneur, to take that plunge into the creation of their own brand. Typically, first, we would see a collaboration, right? They would go to a bigger brand, they would collab, they would see the success that they're getting from that collaboration, specifically from their community buying it, and then that would say, now we can take the next step and become a full entrepreneur. Yeah. So from a beauty standpoint, we're already seeing it play out and the community piece is so strong and you know that authentic community I know we talked about that in kind of the pre-show we're calling this a show uh, but you know just that piece of it you want to be authentic you want a community so find someone who has that and then work authentically with them well, going off of that I mean we were talking before and we we're talking about beauty influencers in particular mm -hmm. right now the totem pole the top of the top the trophy for these beauty influencers is for them to start their own palette line or their own beauty line themselves. So I think the progression is you're a beauty influencer, you're utilizing products that you love, you're going to be talking about those in your videos. From there, you're partnering with those brands that you love um, and you know, getting them sponsored, getting free product to promote on your videos. And then you know, the top of the top, you know, people with 10 million, 50 million followers plus, they're the ones who are able to create their own product because they've been able to accumulate such a big audience. And then, you know, any influencer would love to have their product in a brick and mortar store online. And that's where things just start to turn into not just me being a creator, but really a business and creating a brand where I'm the CEO of my own business. Right. And I think just to bring it full circle, 
then he becomes the expert, right? So I talked about doctors and dermatologists. That isn't, those aren't the only fields that you can have expertise in. He has taken a passion and then turned it into his expertise. And that really is viewed as expertise in the eyes of the consumers through an influencer lens as well. So kind of widening what you see when I say have experience, have an educational background. It doesn't just mean you have schooling. There are a lot of different facets in saying that. Agreed. And then two things no one wants to talk about ever is um, deadlines and budget. Uh, I think the way we contract influencers and creators are, is changing constantly, right? Mostly because social media networks in a lot of uh, cases actually don't want to give them the reach um, that they're able to get to. So kind of clipping their wings, changing the algorithm, um, that's a completely different panel and we won't get into that. But um, are you guys seeing that on the ground, the way Orca play, pays their talent, the way Dylan, your contracts are constantly changing? Is it, is it bonuses versus commissions based on sales or project-based uh, fees? At least as a creator, a lot of Brands nowadays, they're, I mean, obviously the base pay um, and base compensation, but now they're incentivizing influencers. Um, you know, if you hit a certain number of views, more money. And I think that strays away from where I feel like I'm just a salesperson, affiliate marketing as a TikTok creator. I don't like affiliate marketing too much because it makes me feel like I'm a salesperson. But I think these incentives and what brands are pushing for now, it's motivating me and other creators that I manage and creators in my influencer club at USC as well to have the freedom and because I'm a creator who knows my audience well, I can really position my videos to what my audience would love and know that I would do better than where a brand in the past scripted, they made everything and I would just put my name under it. I want to say something off the back of what Dylan just mentioned about not being a salesperson. The work that we do is really specific to driving transactions, and that's why it's so hard for us to find really great talent partners to do that, because we want to find folks that are excited to be that person, that are excited to get someone into a product and drive the sale. And there are other creators who, first and foremost, are serving their audience on their pages, and they will accept brand deals that align with their content within certain bounds. And both of those things, by the way, work for, for the people who are, um, who are working on them. Uh, and then, what was the question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it down to Gavin just to tie this up. So when it comes to contracts, now we have smart oh, yeah. contracts. Now, now brands are willing to pay creators, right, and share the profits. Oh. And we're, we're going to see that a lot on the blockchain yep. as Web3 kind of democratizes that space. Yeah, it's been a holy grail for years, but the idea of being able to put affiliate links, 1099 payments, contractor payments, all into a performance contract and automate it, takes away the invoicing, takes away the, the follow-up, and it's all um, trigger-based. So you can, you can actually write a contract that says, hey, Dylan, if you hit 100,000 views on TikTok by this date, your performance incentive is X and it goes to your crypto wallet. So that's, that's all lines of code that you can build into a smart contract. So if you think of the future on creative endeavors, collaborating with other artists or other brands, and then hitting certain metrics by certain time periods, those are programmable. So that's, that's one of the cool things of Web3 Tech is this concept of Ricardian contracts where we've got a legal agreement, which has you know, rights and responsibilities, and then software code that automates that and makes the payments flow directly. Agreed. I think um, as Web3 becomes um, more demystified, I mean, we always fear things we don't completely understand, right? Um, but the minute we'll start streamlining and we'll understand that everything we do from buying with the Starbucks app this morning uh, all the way you know, to buying a t-shirt on Amazon, we're giving up our information anyway. And actually, Max, you brought it up in the pre-show um, <laughs> about how actually it is safer and more authentic to use those technologies um, when it comes to sales. Using blockchain? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. The, the, the culture of blockchain, as we've talked about, there's an anonymity or pseudo-anonymity around it. But the funny thing about the technology is it's totally traceable. 
the whole technology is public blockchain, right? And so I think we're in a cultural moment where you want some folks who came in early like the idea of the an anonymity or pseudo anonymity, but over time, you will define your identity on the blockchain because you can go through the history um, uh, on the public ledger. Agreed. But, but to answer your question about yep. deals. Yep. Uh, the structure. Yeah. The, the structure. <laughs> I think that it's always changing because mm -hmm. the platforms are changing. You're right. The, the platforms are limiting organic growth for a lot of folks, and that's making their ability as a creator to earn yeah. a little Pushing bit more UGC difficult. Pushing UGC instead of the influencer speeds. Ultimately, for a, for a brand or somebody who's interested in getting their product out into the world or their message out into the world, you get what you pay for. So you do a straight affiliate commission deal, you're gonna get somebody who might show up <laughs> and who might do it. And if you pay some money up front, you're gonna get somebody who's committed uh, to work for their fee and, and everywhere in between. I agree. Um, one, things we know, one thing we know for sure is consumers want to connect to people. Um, they, they don't want to connect to businesses. Um, and that's why my bottom dollar is on creators always outperforming paid ads. But what happens when we bring in AI-based or virtual influencers? How do you guys feel about that? Um, Dylan, would you, <laughs> would you collaborate with a, with a virtual influencer? This is a great question. Um, I was actually at a meeting yesterday and I was talking about AI. I think AI is really good in the fact that I think it's going to be a paintbrush for creators to maximize their time and there's, there's skill set. Mm -hmm. um, Just think, advance the mission, right? Your uh, workflow. Stupid. I mean, 100%. Yeah. I mean, we're already seeing that with you know platforms like ChatGPT and all these other things where it's like, if you ask, give me a caption for this Instagram picture, it'll blast out a caption. And I think that that's where AI is going to be really advantageous. I think right now, consumers and anyone in general, any person who consumes social media, they would rather see a person or a human behind the account because then it's more authentic, it's more genuine. And that's what people follow and that's kind of what people follow on social media right now. I think that AI will be very advantageous for me as a content creator where it's like, if I don't want to edit this picture on Lightroom or et cetera, I can just plug it into a tool, save myself a few hours and then post it on social I won't lie, as a creative agency, um, AI scares the shit out <laughs> of our designers. But you know, the mentality really is to use it as a tool. And, and we're really making sure that they get to know these tools, that it advanced their workflow and creativity, and they use it to get ahead. You know, it's same as electronic music coming into the scene. Um, Lauren, do you think for brands it will actually be easier? You can, you can control an, a virtual yeah. influencer better? Um, I mean, you can, yeah. right? You can control a virtual influencer, although they do have fights with each other, so I don't know. Yeah, but in the, in the end of the day, you're not, you know they're not going to grow up to be a six foot tall. You know, you right. know they're not going to change too much yeah. um, physically or mentally. I mean, I think there's two sides. I think I showed kind of both sides in some of the stats that it's easier to get a, a plethora of work from virtual influencers. But then when we come back to kind of the point that we've all been making about authenticity, right? And so what is the realness in a virtual influencer or a, um, augmented influencer? And I think that's really when we think about beauty and we think about you know the standards that how everybody wants to look and what are you telling your makeup artist or a plastic surgeon? Are you trying to look like a virtual influencer? That's where we need to be really careful because when we look at the data, we have 80% of consumers saying we want to see more realness. We don't want models. So if you don't even want to see a model, then do you really want to see a virtual influencer? So there is a place, there is a way to use them. You have to communicate to the consumer. Don't try to trick them into thinking that, you know, this is just Dylan. No, this is the augmented version of Dylan. And I think if you do it authentically, you can tap into it and tap into both sides. You'll come into trouble if you are trying to kind of sweep it under the rug and not really connect and tell consumers the truth about the type of influencer that you're using. Agreed. Max, would you hire a... Uh... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, think <laughs> I think it's really cool. I, it, you know, already we're, you know, we're already using uh, AI, chat GPT, to populate our uh, product pages with product descriptions. So we can just put the bullet points yep. and it'll create the product page. And our, our head of commerce, Tim, built it on his own. 
It's a plug-in to Excel he built. It was Power pretty cool. Tuning. Get ahead. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Would love to have some AI influencers for sure. <laughs> Not to the detriment of live hosts either. <laughs> but I but I do believe it is a trade-off because. Uh, you, you can imagine that if you need to, if it's beauty and you need to understand how that beauty product is gonna work on your skin or in your situation, you'll wanna interact with someone who you can relate with and for other products and other categories it might be different. Mm -hmm. Gavin, how do you feel about it? I, I think these are all fundamental tools of the future and, and they will, just like blockchain, be used for, for every purpose under the sun. Um, to me, I think the, the AI artwork is, is incredibly compelling. It's going to be a whole mess of, I'm a former IP attorney, so <laughs> even the, you know, the rights to certain styles of artwork, I think, will be litigious and, and, and under, under scrutiny. Um, but I think it just opens up this whole other generation where we, we, we take these low-level jobs of you know, folks in content uh, copywriting shops just cranking out blog spam, let them work a little higher up, um, so just know that everything you read this year probably will be written in part by a computer. And all of the, you know, the graphic images that you think are hand painted, those will likely be enhanced or, or built by computers. And that's just the future we're working in. And I think we're at the base of the mountain, not at the apex of what AI can do. Yeah. We have some really cool stuff this year. I hate admitting it, but you know, a virtual influencer can't disappoint us in any way, right? Is there something comforting <laughs> yeah. about that? Like they'll never, they'll never go. You know, they're not a loose cannon or or a wild card. You could always kind of know that they'll be there forever. Like even after we're not, and maybe for a digital generation that's kind of digital native and embedded in it, this is part of their reality. Um, so, so we learned, we learned uh, how to control our influencers, how to brief them. We learned how to uh, gamify shopping in a way. Um, I, wish, I wish we had the video. Um, that would be an interesting. Okay, well, we'll wrap and then after we'll show the video, but there's ways to gam gamify shopping, right? In a way where I'm excited and I keep on getting those dopamine hits and I'm progressing with the program and I'm, I'm engaged in many ways. Um, just one last word from each and one, uh, every one of you if, to the crowd. Is it a shout out, a tip, a trick, something they can't afford to miss on the show floor? Anyone? I just ah! got here this morning, so <laughs> I'm excited to go to the show floor myself. Yes. I also just got here, so I'm sorry. I haven't been to the expo hall <laughs> yet, so I don't know what's going on yet. So the Save the day, Gavin. No. The <laughs> Look at all the new projector tech. There's, there's again, AI and great uh, lighting really building these really cool displays that can be short format, long format, projection mapping. Uh, I'm just really excited by all the optical tech this year. That's awesome. So thanks for sticking around. We will now do a TikTok. You don't have to be in it. Um, it's just part of the experience. Dylan, do you want to? Let's get out my phone. Do you want to showcase and help us navigate this? What are right. you doing, Dylan? That's a good question. I didn't prep. Um, so what I want to do, and I've performed at a lot of different cities and like doing music, um, is I really like showing us on this side and then flipping the camera to you guys. And if you guys want to wave, get excited, all of that, I think that would be exciting. Get really excited. <laughs> all right. So OK. So you guys have to get close. Do you want them to stand up? Yeah, you guys stand up. Stand up, move up, closer to the stage. Get closer. It's going out to your, your million folks. It will. I'll post right. on Snapchat as well. <laughs> All right. Wait, All right. how about when we turn to you guys? Guys, I trust you. Be with me on this. It's Dylan's birthday soon. You guys are all going to sing. We'll sing happy birthday together, and we'll give him this amazing token <laughs> <laughs> for the Excalibur cuisine. All okay. right, so I'm going to I'm going to flip the camera. I'm going to put two fingers up. I go to USC fight on so it's like a little <laughs> thing to dig. So I'm going to put two fingers up and that's when you guys it'll be pointed at you, you guys. You guys are good sports. Amazing. What's up TikTok? We're at CES right now. We just finished a panel um, amazing panel about creators and retail. Now I'm going to flip it. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dylan. Happy birthday to you. Remember, the house all
always wins. <laughs> but if it doesn't, take care of this panel, okay? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much, guys.